Funding for Policy Watch with Doug Bezheroff is provided by the Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation. A half century after the end of the Second World War, the crimes of the Holocaust again touched off a political firestorm. Shocking stories emerged of long dormant bank accounts, confiscated property, looted art and unpaid insurance policies. In heated diplomatic negotiations involving the Swiss, German, French and Austrian governments, as well as corporations who profited from wartime slave labor on both sides of the Atlantic, these issues laid bare the decades-old disputes and still unhealed wounds of World War II. Were the victims fairly compensated? What is the measure of justice? To find out, Policy Watch is joined this week by Stuart Eisenstadt, former Deputy Secretary of the Treasury and Special Representative of the President and Secretary of State for Holocaust Issues, and the author of Imperfect Justice, Looted Assets, Slave Labor, and the Unfinished Business of World War II. Now, from the University of Maryland, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besheroff. Stu Eisenstadt, welcome to Policy Watch and the University of Maryland. Let's talk about your book. You know, I, I think of myself as a relatively well-informed person, and I can close my eyes and picture the victims of the Holocaust. But somehow I never asked myself, well, what happened to their possessions? Thought about the camps, thought about the terrible murders, but never thought about the the other takings. Well, Doug, frankly, that is the common view, and it's why it took 50 years after the war for this issue to come back on the agenda. And indeed, the victims themselves were so intent on trying to make a new life in, in, in a new country, whether it was Israel, the United States, that they rarely talked about these possessions themselves. What we're f facing and what I describe in both the book and the work I did as President Clinton's special representative on Holocaust issues was in effect to bring back an issue that had not been on the world agenda for five decades. The Germans not only killed victims, they really stole their culture, their possessions, their art, their property, their insurance policies. They coerced 10 million people, Jews and non-Jews, indeed the majority non-Jews, into coerced, forced, enslaved labor. That's indeed how they manned the war effort. As they were occupying large parts of Eastern Europe, Doug, they took the people from those countries and moved them onto the German farms and factories, freeing up Germans to fight on the war front. It's how the Germany had such a huge standing army. Uh, in addition, there were bank accounts, thousands of bank accounts, as we later learned, that were kept in Swiss banks by victims trying to keep their assets out of the clutches of Hitler. And then for five decades after the war, as people trooped through the snows of Switzerland trying to recapture their family bank accounts, they were told, where's your death certificate, which Auschwitz did not conveniently provide. So what we confronted here was not only the greatest genocide in history, Doug, it was the greatest theft and robbery in history. So well, that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit. Now, we, sh we shouldn't just leave it with the Germans. The Austrians did a pretty good job taking property as well, didn't they? The Austrians were also employers of forced and slave labor. By the way, so were the Swiss through their subsidiaries in Germany. The French banks uh, had a similar record to the uh, banks in Switzerland. They were also the repositories of accounts that were not returned. And the artwork in places like France, thousands of pieces we've, through our work, now gotten the French to post on a website, 2,000 pieces of artwork that were in the Louvre, the Jeux de Pomme, some of the very best museums in France that they now admit were looted and had never been returned for 50 years. 600,000 paintings were taken. And one of the ways the Germans financed the war effort was that as they were sweeping through Europe, they not only took the people from their countries and forced them to work, they took their possessions, they took their watches, their jewelry, their earrings uh, and smelted them into disguised gold bars along with the bars of gold from the central banks of the countries they occupied. All of this was re-smelted given disguised stamps to make it look like it had come from the Reich Bank and then it was laundered through the Swiss National Bank 
and convert it into the hard currency, Swiss francs, that the Germans needed to purchase from other neutrals, the war materials that sustained their war efforts. So this was all very systematic and not random. And your best judgment is that the Swiss bankers knew where this gold was coming from? As early as 1941, the Allies, the United States, told them and their internal records, as we've now disclosed and as their own historical commission disclosed, they knew they were dealing in looted gold because they realized that the inventory of the German Reichsbank had been very low before the war. So they were told from 41 through the end of the war in 45, you're dealing in looted gold, stop the practice, you're sustaining the war effort, and they not only continued to convert the gold into the hard currency that, again, was essential, but after the war, Doug, when there was no risk of invasion at all, obviously, for six long years, they negotiated with the United States. Our chief negotiator told me, he was still alive when we were writing the book, that they simply, quote unquote, wore us down for six long years instead of returning the looted gold and other German assets they had for the benefit of refugees, they kept it and returned in the end only a tiny fraction of what they had in their possession. And I want to talk a little bit more about that period, but first, in the book, you raise the question of neutrality versus morality. And it does seem as if the Swiss and, as, as you know, uh, the Turks, Spain, Portugal, they were all trading with the Nazis. And Sweden, yes. Uh, look, Switzerland had been officially neutral since 1815. It, it is a very systematic part of their foreign policy. The difference was here one was dealing with the evil incarnate. And the question was, what did neutrality really mean under these circumstances? Sweden was providing ball bearings. Turkey was providing cobalt. Spain and Portugal hardened steel and tungsten. They, in the end, stopped that practice under Allied pressure. The Swiss never stopped the practice of converting the gold. Now, there certainly comes some point at which you have to protect your own sovereignty. You have to be concerned about being invaded and there are certain pressures, and we have to be sympathetic and understand that. But unfortunately, these practices occurred long after D-Day, long after the tide of the war had changed, long after there was any real threat of a German invasion. So that money and profit was as much a motive as fear. And as you point out, after the war, after the Allies are victorious, the Swiss and other nations we're still not forthcoming to settle. One these can accounts. say a lot about, I think, the character of the country by what happened after the war. Sweden, for example, quite promptly returned as much as they had. Spain and Portugal took a little longer, but at least there was some recompense. But again, the worst of the neutrals were the Swiss, who for six years after the war niggled over every conceivable item over the value of what they had and returned in the end the tiniest fraction. Now, why did the United States accept that? And this says a lot, Doug, about why it took 50 years to get all this back. It is because during the war, as we uncovered and others did, FDR knew about the genocide of the Jews and other civilians and never really raised a finger. And after the war, there was no real attention to the plight of refugees. They drifted in the displaced persons camps, stayed there for as long as five years. And the Cold War, when it started just 1948, 49, shortly after the war, all the energies of the United States that might have been directed to helping the victims of World War II were now directed to the future to create the Western Alliance, NATO, that in effect combated the Soviet threat and the plight of the refugees, it appeared, would drift into the mists of history gone forever. Was it only possible because the U.S. And, and Jimmy Carter and then you got involved? Is this really an American story? It's an American story very heavily because President Clinton uh, was willing to make this a major issue. Edgar Bronfman, the head of the World Jewish Congress, and Israel Singer, his assistant, had already been interested in the whole communal property issue. They later became interested in the Swiss bank issue. And Bronfman was a key political supporter of Bill and Hillary Clinton and also a major constituent in New York of Alphonse D'Amato. In fact, it's sort of ironic as I, and almost humorous as I point out in the book, that at the very time Bronfman activated Clinton, who in turn got me involved, 
and activated uh, D'Amato, who was head of the Senate Banking Committee. D'Amato was holding Whitewater hearings, right. trying to pin the Whitewater savings and loan scandal on the president, and yet he was able, Bronfman was, to get both of them to work together. For D'Amato, this was a political godsend because the Whitewater hearings were very unpopular for him, and every day he held a hearing, his popularity in New York went down and Clinton's went up. So out went the Whitewater hearings, in came the Swiss banks, and I testified along with Bronfman, and someone who became very critical in this issue uh, named Greta Beer. Uh, Greta Beer became, in effect, the poster child. She was uh, in an article by Peter Gumbel in the Wall Street Journal in the summer of 1995. And Gumbel deserves a lot of credit, Doug, for uncovering the whole issue of dormant Swiss bank accounts, accounts that people put in Switzerland to save their money from Hitler, and then their families were never able to get that money back after the war. And by giving a human face, this elegant elderly lady, Greta Beer, who lives in Boston, and we're still in very, very regular contact. Uh, she testified, and she was a sensation. She talked about how she had, for 40 years, tried to track down her family's bank accounts in one Swiss bank after another. We should give a little background here for some of our audience. Many Jews, German Jews and others, seeing this calamity coming, tried to protect their cash assets by putting them in that neutral bank right in Switzerland, uh, private banking where they, the money they thought could be protected no matter what, and that they or their heirs could come and then claim the money afterwards. Exactly. That's they were often the given, in fact, Doug, numbered accounts, which they felt were the greatest protection against Germany trying to grab them because they were not easily identified. It's the bank's secrecy that Switzerland is so famous for, but it ended up being turned on its head because after the war, when families like Greta, for example, the daughter of uh, a father who had put his assets there tried to get it. She didn't have a number. She had a name. And she had to prove that he was killed by the Germans. And, uh, you know, thousands of others. When I first went to Switzerland in 1996, and I actually brought this Wall Street Journal article that first uncovered it to the Swiss Bankers Association, I said, tell me about this. Is this true? These dormant bank accounts, do they really exist? Have you not paid these for 50 years? Unfortunately, they said there is an element of truth to it. We've had our own investigation, and there are 775, and we're going to pay every nickel. Well, four years later, after a commission we created headed by Paul Volcker charged the Swiss banks uh, $200 million in audit fees, there weren't 775. There were 21,000 of a possible population that may be as large as 54,000 of these bank accounts. And these bank accounts, now I know my bank account will charge me a fee if I have less than whatever it is, $50 or $500. But these bank accounts, many of them were charged large, these were large accounts, but these were charged large enough fees so that for some of them, the Swiss banks claimed that the, um, the total left in the account was zero. Exactly. In fact, what they did, and Paul Volcker, who himself is a distinguished international banker, said he was shocked to find that any banking system would do this. They literally ran these accounts down by charging fees for the dormant accounts until they, in effect, taking it all into profit, had drawn them down to zero. It was a, just a remarkably callous uh, practice. Some of the discovery of these accounts uh, was because of an individual in a Swiss bank, right, who came forward and said, I found some records here that you ought to see. At a time when it appeared that the Swiss bank issue might not really take off and bring back the issue of justice for Holocaust victims after 50 years, an incident occurred which created a tremendous spark. A young security guard named Christoph Miley, who now lives in, in uh, California, he escaped, in effect escaped from Switzerland because there were death threats about him. He was making his rounds at one of the Swiss banks. And he went into a room which was their shredding room. He had read about the hearings. And he told me later that he had seen Schindler's List, the famous uh, Spielberg movie, just a few weeks before. And he sees these voluminous books about to be shredded, and he starts to open them. And it looks as if it's accounts from 1933 to 45, all sorts of records of these accounts that D'Amato was holding hearings about and that we were beginning to investigate. He rips these accounts out, takes some of the books with him, goes from one newspaper to another, nobody was interested, went to the Israeli embassy, they said, you know, get away, we have no interest in this. 
Finally, one journalist in Switzerland was interested, published the story. It became an international sensation because what it did, Doug, is connected what had happened 50 years earlier where there had been, in effect, an effort not to give back accounts with what was still happening in 1996, 97, 98. Still an effort not to come clean. And with that, the whole spotlight of history shined not only as Swiss banks but on the broader issue of justice to victims. And then it was like peeling back the layers of an onion. One discovery led to another, and we moved from property restitution in Eastern Europe to Swiss banks to German and Austrian slave labor employers and then uh, to the French banks. And as I think we know in this country, anytime there's controversy, there are going to be lawyers, and I can say that being one. And here there were massive class action suits brought by a very colorful, discordant group of class actions. Uh, lawyers against the Swiss bankers, against the German and Austrian slave labor employers, the Siemenses and Volkswagens, uh, and yes, Fords and IBMs, um, and against the French banks. And I became the, in effect, unintended ringmaster of a three-ring circus, the mediator in all these suits, and we ended up with $8 billion in recoveries for victims. I don't think either one of us are in the Holocaust uh, industry business, but it is striking. Uh, the behaviors that you documented? Well, I have to say that one of the most disturbing aspects of the aftermath of what we've done is that now, three or four years after we reached these historic agreements in which countries began to come to terms with their past and paid victims five decades later, and private companies, Doug, for the first time in the annals of history did so, we see a new wave of anti-Semitism. Now, let me suggest that only in Switzerland did our negotiations lead to an increase in anti-Semitic views. That did not occur in France, in Austria, or in Germany. Indeed, editorials and polls showed strong support for what we were doing. Nevertheless, there is an outbreak of anti-Semitism, and let me deal with it in this fashion, because I think they're unrelated to my negotiations. In countries like France, Belgium, and, and, and other places, almost all the actual overt anti-Semitic incidents against synagogues and individuals are from angry North African Muslim youth who are sort of taking their anger at both their lack of assimilation into European societies and at the Palestinian and Israeli society out on vulnerable Jewish populations. Even that, however, is also too easy an answer. There is, in fact, still a veneer of anti-Semitism in Europe 60 years after the war. It's not as pervasive as what it was before the war or during the war. It's not the sort of classic stereotyped anti-Semitism. But Jews in Europe today, 2003, are nowhere near as integrated into their societies as the Jewish community is in the United States. Uh, when my wife and I used to go around Europe uh, in our diplomatic travels, you could always tell where a Jewish school or a Jewish synagogue was because there would be concrete barriers and police. And at one level, that's good. They were trying to protect the community, but it said something that that protection was necessary. And I have to say also, while I have my own concerns about some aspects of Israel's policy and the settlements and the like, the degree to which some in Europe have taken their anti-Israel feelings does mean that in some parts of European society, particularly academic elites, that there is a sort of collective anti-Semitism against Israel. When professors, hundreds and hundreds of professors from Britain and on the continent want to boycott Israeli universities, when labor unions in Norway and Ireland refuse to offload Israeli products, when you get that kind of effort to make Israel into a pariah state, one has to say that it's more than just a legitimate criticism, and Israel should be subject to criticisms like any other country. This goes beyond the pale, so it is troubling. You were the lead U.S. negotiator in efforts to obtain compensation for the victims of Nazi terror, both Jews and non-Jews. And all told, you were able to obtain a very large financial and other package, I think $8 billion. Plus art, insurance, plus art, and bank insurance accounts, and, and so forth. forth. Uh, many have said, and, and I think you've referred to uh, the arguments as well in your book, that it's wrong to monetize these kinds of horrors 
and that, that, that monetizing them somehow diminishes their uh, immorality. And I know you've thought about this. Why don't you tell us your thinking about why it's important to monetize them? There are many critics, including a few in the Jewish community, who have expressed just those views, that somehow by monetizing the injustices done, that the victimization, uh, the Holocaust itself, has somehow been diminished. I really reject that for two reasons, Doug. First, in every civilized society, the way we compensate wrongs, whether it's the breach of a contract, whether it's a truck running someone over, uh, whether it's an act of negligence, is by monetizing it. I mean, with 9-11, what did we do with the families who lost loved ones? We, we monetize that recovery. It's, it's one way in which we bring accountability. If that's true in day-to-day -day activities, for the greatest wrong perhaps ever perpetrated, that is the Holocaust itself, why should that not also be compensable? And second, by saying that it should not be a compensable wrong, you're in effect allowing those who profited by theft, by stealing art and insurance and bank accounts and workers who were working for nothing, like, um, like African-American slaves. You're in effect saying that they should keep their ill-gotten goods. I don't accept that. It's also the case uh, that many of these people were owed right, concrete assets. It was their art that was taken away. It was their or their um, um, parents or relatives whose bank accounts were not made available. It's yeah, not it was just, their labor. It was their labor. This is not as if it was just, well, a great harm was done to you and we're compensating you for it. Here there were concrete assets that were being um, returned, either in cash or, or otherwise. Also, it's not just that there were monetary uh, um, remedies. Uh, many nations responded with commissions of their own, right? Well, this is very important. We were absolutely determined, Doug, that we didn't want the last word on the Holocaust as survivors were passing away, as we were going into the 21st century, to be simply money. As important as it was to have assets returned, we wanted something broader. And this, I think, was the perhaps most lasting impact of what we did. We got the presidents of Austria and Germany to publicly apologize in their countries for their company's misuse of slave and forced labor. We had four international conferences with over 40 countries in London, Washington, Stockholm, and in uh, Lithuania. Uh, to encourage countries to open their archives, to look at their past, to face what they had done. We created 21 historical commissions from Argentina, which harbored Nazis during and after the war, to Lithuania, which willingly participated in the Holocaust. And may I say that those, the most searching of those 21 commissions were the Swiss and the French commissions. And I think it will strengthen those countries to have their own commissions look at their past. And last, we've created a 16-nation Holocaust education task force from Sweden, yes, to Poland, so that we are promoting Holocaust education in school systems, not because we want young kids exposed to the gruesome horrors of the Holocaust, but because we want young people to understand what happens when good people and good countries stand on the sidelines in the face of injustice and intolerance. Before we end, let me ask the young boy from Atlanta, the young Jewish boy from Atlanta, this whole process of trying to get um, uh, the repayment from the Nazi horrors. What was the most rewarding time for you in that entire well, first process? First of all, let me say that if I had only seen myself as a Jewish representative rather than an American diplomat who happened to bring Jewish values, I would never have been able to get the trust and confidence of both sides in this negotiation. But the reason I asked, I understand, and I'm glad that you corrected me. The reason I said it that way, we all come from our roots, and, and I didn't I, mean that. I never have backed away from, apologized, and indeed are very proud of my roots. I think that, fr frankly, it's not one individual recovery. It is the fact that 50 years later, there was some accountability, that before it was too late, before this window of opportunity closed on survivors who were dying, Doug, at 10% a year, 
that they recognized that there was some accountability, some justice. Now, I call the book Imperfect Justice because it was imperfect. It didn't help those who died during the Holocaust. It didn't help those except their heirs who passed away between the end of World War II and our involvement in the mid-1990s and into 2001. Uh, and there can be, in a sense, no adequate compensation for the brutality that was done to individuals and the theft of property. But I get a great sense of satisfaction that there was, if belated, some justice, that the truth came out about the dimensions of the theft, that this is an issue came back on the world agenda, that people were forced to confront the fact that, as you started the program, it was not just camps. It was stealing assets and, indeed, a whole culture. And that at the end of the day, as we went into the 21st century, that dimension of what otherwise might have been ignored has been recognized, has been dealt with, yes, in an imperfect way, but dealt with, uh, and that we've tried to complete a circle and have a better understanding of what really happened in World War II, not just to individuals, but to that which they felt was precious, their own assets. Stu Eisenstadt, on behalf of the University of Maryland and Policy Watch. Thank you very Thank you much for being with us. Please join us in a future episode for part two of our interview with Stuart Eisenstadt. Funding for Policy Watch with Doug Bezheroff is provided by the Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation. We are PBS.